Welcome to the program. Today we've got Glenn Beck here to talk about the TikTok bill. Dan Andros joins us with some thoughts on the Supreme Court. We're going to start by doing the eco meltdown. Yes, Joe Biden is always on top of everything. That you should know. Joe Biden is always locked into exactly the, the pulse of America, always doing exactly what we need. And uh, that's why he's uh, have, has a bunch of new eco rules. Biden administration announcing rules aimed at phasing out gas cars. Yes, phasing them out completely. Um, now, of course, that's the long term goal. The short term goal, a little bit different. Uh, he says the majority of new passenger cars and light trucks sold in the United States are all electric or hybrids by 2032. Now, of course, they can't make you do that. Right. They can't just say you need to buy an electric or hybrid car. We sort of have a constitution that, that, that is around right now. Now, electric cars made up just 7.6 percent of U.S. car sales. The new regulation would need to be 56 um, percent. That is a, a, a much higher number. And as Stephen Moore points out, uh, seven out of the 10 states with the most EV uh, bu- buying is going on in blue states. But all 10 of the states with the fewest EVs are in red states. Basically, Republicans don't want these things. And Democrats uh, are buying some of them, but not nearly enough. So this is a major problem. Let me go through some of the details of this bill. Um, 7.6% of U.S. car sales, 56% target is where they want this to be. Obviously a massive gap there. Biden said, three years ago, I set an ambitious target that half of all new cars and trucks sold in 2030 would be zero emission. Together, we've made historic progress. Uh, The rule increasingly limits the amount of pollution allowed from tailpipes over time so that by 2032, more than half the cars would have to basically be electric or um, hybrid. So they're taking your choices away uh, slowly. And of course, they don't have to pass a new law. They just kind of garner this authority from the Clean Air Act. And it's like, well, we can do whatever we want because we're the government. Now, that's a fascinating part of this whole story. But what is the actual state of the electric vehicle market right now? Because I don't think it looks so good. Let me give you some of what is going on right now that you probably haven't heard in the mainstream media about electric cars. And we've mentioned this chart a couple of times. This is just to give you a sense of how this looks. Uh, electric vehicle startups, Lucid is down 95%, Rivian is down 94%, Nikola is down 99%, and Polestar is down 91% in their stock price. That's not good. Just in case you were like, I, I'm on the fence. Is that a, is a, what kind of performance is that? Is that positive? No. You know, I've heard, I've read a lot of articles. Bitcoin goes down by 10%, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, crypto is dead. Yet these electric cars can go down by 90, 95, 99%, and no one seems to even acknowledge it. Now, this also goes along at the same time with Hertz. Hertz embraced the CEO, the, uh, the uh, electric vehicle thing, and their CEO really stepped up and said, we're going all in on these electric vehicles. It was very trendy to do at the time. What's the update? Well, Hertz CEO is out following the electric car horror show. This is from CNN, and you can tell it's from CNN as I read part of it. A company which announced in January it was selling 20,000 of their electric vehicles in its fleet, or about a third of the EVs it owned, is now replacing the CEO who built up that fleet, giving the company's fifth boss in just four, four years. In the most recent quarter, Hertz took a $245 million hit to its earnings due to the drop in value of the EVs it was selling. Now, of course, you know, CNN has to be CNN and say this. The problem for Hertz wasn't necessarily that the cars were electric and that customers simply just do not want to drive electric cars. The problem was how Hertz handled the fleet in general, according to industry analysts. And they found one who will actually say this, Daniel Ives. He says the execution and marketing of the EVs by Hertz was a horror show across the board. It's a black eye they couldn't recover from. But think about this for a second. I mean, electric vehicles can be fine for certain things. We've said this a hundred times. There's nothing wrong with an electric vehicle per se if it fits your needs and you want to buy it. I've got a couple of friends who love their electric vehicles, uh, both Teslas. They think they're great cars. They are incredibly fast. The way the charging thing works out, I have other friends who do not like theirs at all. Uh, but for a rental car, 
You want to go into an unfamiliar town you just flew into and get an electric rental car where you have to you have to buy you have to figure out what hotel you want based on whether they have a charger there. Of course, if you get there, they might not have the charger active. It might not work. You don't know where to go to get them. You're going to uncomfortable areas. You're trying to drive long distances. You have to stop and charge all the time. No one wants this as a rental car. Maybe around your town it works. A rental car? That's insane. But that's just one of the many problems that we haven't really thought of. We've talked over and over again about the electric grid. Can this really handle this sort of transition? It doesn't seem to be, you know, we're having blackouts now. What happens with all this in the future? Well, how about this for a problem you haven't maybe thought of yet? A study from the University of Nebraska, the Nebraska experts are weighing highway safety and electric vehicles. Well, what does this mean? Well, they did a crash test. This happened on, in October 2023. It highlighted the concern at 60 miles an hour, the 7,000 plus pound 2022 Rivian R1T. Uh, that's one of those companies that's down over 90 percent. Uh, they tore through the barrier with little reduction in speed. In a separate test conducted in, 20, uh, in September, a 2018 Tesla Model 3 lifted the guardrail and passed below it, coming to rest after the barrier. These are the results of these tests over and over again. The guardrail system of the United States needs to be rethought. The system that was tested features a 12-gauge corrugated steel guardrail attached to a 6-inch deep steel posts anchored to the rail uh, with black uh, blockouts 8 to 12 inches thick. The top of the rail is 31 inches above the road. Standard guardrails. They work for cars all the time. Well, eh, when you got an electric one, maybe not. Um, they had a te They tested this. With small cars that weigh up to 2,400 pounds and pickups that weigh 5,000 pounds when they, deny, they designed it. But up until now, little has been known about how the system will perform in crashes involving electric vehicles, which typically weigh 20 to 50 percent more than gas powered cars with lower centers of gravity. So we also just have to replace all the guardrails in the country. Is that a problem for you? Why do you hate the environment so much? By the way, no emissions coming from replacing an entire guardrail system of a country. Totally emission free. Uh, California, they've been they've got a grid problem, as you might know. They've had it for years and years and years. Now they're trying to charge all these electric cars. Guess what's happening? California energy costs double the national average, threatening EV adoption. Is our goal EV adoption or is it for human beings to flourish? Which one is it? I, we talk so much about how wonderful the earth is and how we have to save the earth. Well, what good is saving the earth if, if you don't? You can't get around. You can't live your life. I mean, saving the earth is this like theoretical thing we talk about when in reality there's been long term studies about how life would need to be adjusted if all of their science is perfect. And of course, when you come down to it, spending money like this is insane. You could spend trillions of dollars on global warming for less of an impact than we could spend billions or hundreds of millions of dollars on something like malaria. We could do that right now and actually help people in need. But no, that's not what we do. Um, of course, these things might not help the planet at all. The electric vehicles release more, more toxic emissions and are worse for the environment than gas-powered cars. With a new study, this is from uh, Emissions Analytics. It was released in 2022, but has been mentioned lately in a Wall Street Journal op-ed. It found that the brakes and tires on electric vehicles release 1,850 times more particle pollution compared to modern tailpipes, which uh, have efficient exhaust fil uh, filters. Today, most vehicle-related pollution comes not from the engine, but from tire wear. Because electric vehicles are on average 30% heavier, brakes and tires on the battery-powered cars wear out faster than on standard cars. This is from Nick Molden. He's the founder of Emissions Analytics and the CEO. He says, you have a trade-off. At the moment, the political agenda is very strong toward climate change reduction. EVs do deliver about a 50% reduction in CO2, and that theoretically that's my addition, affects climate change. But you have this downside of EVs that increases particle pollution. Air pollution is about what we breathe and has health effects. Um, the toxins in the tires have much less impact on climate change than they do on what we eat and what we are ingesting. Increased exposure to these toxins can increase the risk of health problems like heart disease, asthma, and low birth weight. Does that sound like a good trade-off? Yeah, in 100 years, maybe the temperature is one-tenth of a degree cooler. But you're increasing the risk of all these terrible things to people who are here, you know, alive now. And maybe we should think about what we're doing for the people who are alive now 
and let the people in 100 years, with 100 years of scientific progress, figure out a better way to deal with that one-tenth of a degree or so we might see. Uh, the new surge in power use is threatening U.S. climate goals. This uh, comes from the New York Times. Um, and, you know, we've talked about this a little bit this week as well. But I also have this, and this is something, I'm sorry, if you're listening on podcasts, you might not recognize, you don't know what this is. I want to show it to the audience. Uh, this here, it's called a magazine. This one is uh, Haggerty Drivers Club. And uh, it's a great car magazine if you like the cars. By the way, their videos on YouTube are freaking awesome. If you like car videos, uh, look at, watch those Haggerty videos. They're awesome. But let me just give you a couple of details from this. This is a t- an article titled, The Electric Forecast Gets Cloudier, an industry that only a year ago was rushing headlong into expanding ba- battery manufacturing and race to market with full electric product, product lines suddenly nailed the brakes. Ford, reeling from a costly UAW strike, said it will slow roll and earmark $12 billion in electrification spending, stopping uh, some of the production of the Mach-E and the F-150 Lightning. GM and Honda likewise said they are scrapping an agreement to jointly produce a compact electric crossover. Mercedes-Benz dealers were in open revolt over the factory's unwillingness to put incentives on its slow-moving EQ line of pricey electrics. GM offered Buick and Cadillac dealers a choice, either invest upward of $200,000 each in electric, uh, electric uh, infra- infrastructure for their dealerships, or they could sell their franchises back to GM for cash. Almost half of Buick dealers and one-third of Cadillac dealers took the buyout. The average number of days an EV spends on a dealer lot, 111. Gas vehicles, 55. Which one would you want as a dealer? And I'll leave you with this. Currently, the pricing gap between EVs and internal combustion engines offer uh, the hot uh, in the hot compact SUV segment is almost twenty thousand dollars. At the same time, older affordable EV options have been taken off the market because they're not selling enough. The bottom line is this is the worst we've ever seen the EV market. And then, of course, the one company that actually seems to be able to do this somewhat correctly is Tesla. And the government hates them because their their CEO likes free speech. And what is Joe Biden doing? Doubling, tripling, quadrupling down with your money and your freedom. So do you want all your investments going to electric car manufacturers? Do you want them going to ESG companies? Do you want them going uh, to uh, companies that are targeting the things you actually care about? Probably not. Look, if you've got a portfolio and you're looking at your portfolio and you've got, you know, some decent money stashed away and you've got an advisor to help you uh, manage the craziness of our financial markets, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, you know, I've done some good things in my life. I've actually accomplished some things. And that's great. But if you're fighting with your, the rest of your life against some crackdowns that are coming from the government, uh, unconstitutional mandates, you're out there speaking out, you're trying to convince your friends, you're voting, you're doing everything you can. And then you have hundreds of thousands of dollars that are helping these companies. And it's bigger than that, because when you're invested in some of these, you know, firms that are woke and have ESG, they control your voting rights. So if you want to stop ESG, you've got to take your money out and go bring it with a company that can control your voting rights and help you vote for the right things. Let me introduce you to Constitution Wealth. If you have 250000 or more of stock and bond investments and would like to reduce your exposure to woke companies, Get a consultation with these guys right now. They know this landscape really well. ConstitutionWealth.com slash Stu. ConstitutionWealth.com slash Stu. Don't help woke. Don't help ESG. Don't help CRT. ConstitutionWealth.com slash Stu. It's Constitution Wealth. I'm joined once again by Glenn Beck. He has a brand new special coming up next at 9 p.m. Eastern right here on Blaze TV. Tonight it is called Debate. Is the TikTok bill a Trojan horse for government censorship? Uh, big, big, it's a big story, and Glenn's going to be covering it tonight uh, with a couple of our favorites from Congress. There's like only like yeah. four of them, so you've got two of them on tonight. I know. <laughs> yeah, I've got two of them. I Chip Roy and Thomas Massey. They're both on the opposite sides of this. They're good friends and, you know, good friends of mine, and uh, so I'm going to do what I can to... Well, I told them I was going to do what I could to keep it civil, but I'm going to see if I can cause some strife between the two of them. You're going to sow discord? Uh, no, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's actually just a very polite debate, because I don't know, Stu, have you made up your mind on this? You know, honestly, I think the answer to that is no, 
I, you know, I've gone back <laughs> right. and forth. I've leaned 51 yeah, 49 too. both ways a couple times. Um, and it's, yep. I yep. do get the arguments on both sides of it. It is one of those sorts of stories. I'm hoping that one of them is going to make a knockout uh, punch argument, um, but I don't know which one it's going to be. Um, and I respect both of these guys deeply. So we'll we'll see. Uh, and that's coming up in just a minute. Um, can we discuss this story a little bit before you get on with these guys? Because like I my my lean here is, look, this is a foreign adversary, an enemy. There's only four on our list of enemies, basically. Uh, four countries. Mm-hmm. China's mm-hmm. one of them. They operate this. It's t- terrible for the country. They're doing all sorts of really bad things with it. At no point in history can I imagine us saying, oh, yeah, sure, Nazi Germany, uh, Soviet Union, you guys come right in and do whatever you want with all of our people and all their devices, where you can track everywhere each one of them is. That seems really bad. On the other hand, I yeah. feel like I don't want the government passing laws against individual companies. And I also, you know, when I'm kind of 50-50 on something, I feel like I should be leaning against government intervention. Yeah. Well, I will tell you that uh, I kind of feel the I kind of feel the same way. Um, I, I, I don't like government intervention in things, especially when it comes to companies. Um However, just like you said, we wouldn't have done it with the Soviets or the Nazis. Uh, Why are we allowing this to happen with the uh, Chinese? On the other hand, I mean, you have to have like eight hands for this. But on the other hand, uh, you have uh, the Democrats and Joe Biden uh, just so willingly. Oh, we got to jump on board. Um, And it makes me nervous because Joe Biden, while he was against TikTok. He started using TikTok, and then uh, it's one of the most effective platforms. <clears throat> and now he wants to sign the bill to cancel TikTok. So I just don't trust that there's not something else going on that we don't understand yet. Yeah, and Donald Trump has also gone on both sides of this. He he was famously calling for a ban yeah. of TikTok, and then now is opposing uh, this potential bill. And again, it's not a ban. It, it you know it could be a ban if they decided not to sell it. It would be a strange decision to not. Yeah, do they that. could. I mean, they could. They could sell it. I mean, you could. I'm sure you could find a, an investor here in the United States. Maybe maybe Hunter Biden that uh, would buy it, and it'd be straight up safe then. I mean, I'd be happy to buy it. I don't think I can afford it. I'd be happy to buy it and take it from the Chinese. Right. Um, But again, like, what are you even getting out of that? You're going to get someone who's probably very friendly. Who knows if they're actually, you know, you know, uh, keeping the data away from the Chinese. And as we've seen with, you know, U.S. tech companies, they're not exactly the, the guardians of our data either. No. No, I think this is um, this is this this is bad technology um, in the hands of anybody nefarious. And unfortunately, I don't trust any side. You know, it's kind of like the Ukraine Russia thing uh, where uh, I know Russia's bad. I know Ukraine's bad and I'm pretty sure we're bad. So I don't know, but I'm kind of for the people of Ukraine, you know, (laughs) You know, uh, and I just it's not clear cut in my head yet. Um, one qu- one thing I'd be interested to see if they comment on is there's this, the, the one part that does look a little too vague and broad in this bill is a section about what can, constitutes a foreign adversary. Right. And it has like a, a person from one of our four foreign adversary countries, a, a company owned by one of the four um, adversary countries. And then the last one is. I think it's a U.S. person who is controlled by one of these four uh, adversary countries. And it's like, well, gosh, I mean, how many times have they said you're controlled or Donald Trump is controlled by Russia? Right. Like, how? I mean, could he own Truth Social? Well, here here's two examples. I'm controlled by Jews. Uh, I had that said to me, Israel, I'm controlled by Israel. Um, and then Tucker Carlson, he's control. I mean, if you don't think that they wouldn't have used that very uh, line against Tucker Carlson, uh, you're crazy. Yeah. Because I mean, that's what everybody was saying. It's true. I, I wonder if there's a way to actually just fix this bill and do what they're trying to do with it. Or if it's just, you know, we just got to throw it out because you can't trust the government. As we've seen with even good bills, they use well, Massey it. Massey says it's a giant Trojan horse. Yeah.
That's going to be a fascinating debate. And two smart guys, and that's going to be a good way of actually, yeah. I don't know, getting to an answer rather than uh, what they do. Yeah, that's on, all on I want. I, honestly, I, I, I really don't. I, I don't want to do all the work and start from scratch. These guys have done enough of them. Just give me your best case so I can just kind of drift into this opinion. You, you know? know, Glenn, you sound like someone who's advocating for a representative <laughs> government. And that that sounds I know it's crazy. It's crazy. Wow. I'm not, of course. Um, let me ask you about uh, something else we talked about on radio earlier today. Uh, and we had uh, it was a bunch of great guests on radio today, one of which is Ken Paxson. We had him on a bunch of times. And he's talking about the Texas situation. And can you, from your perspective, what did you hear him say? And were you troubled or nervous about it at all? Well, yes, because the way I phrased the question was Ken, um, you know, when earlier this week, when um, they said we couldn't enforce our laws, we had a lot of Texans that were like, to hell with that. And I said, you know, there's an old saying, don't mess with Texas. And I think a lot of people take that, you know, uh, to heart. And how do you keep a people calm and and on the right path when uh, they feel like they're being railroaded. And um, he didn't give me calming advice. Uh, uh, He said, well, we have the next election. He said, but um, in the end, if you don't have a rule of law, if you if you have a, a court system or a country that says you cannot protect your own people, then you don't have a constitutional republic anymore. And we're back to the Declaration of Independence um, and requiring people to stand up for it. OK, okay. <laughs> um, now, I don't want to go all bloodbath here. Right. Because he did talk about the election. Um, and he did say stand up. He didn't say go to war. But I walked away from that interview feeling as though uh, that was a historic comment. Maybe, you know, maybe not the top of the page, but at least a footnote kind of comment of where we are. When you have the attorney general of Texas, um, who's very smart very well spoken he's an attorney he knows he watches his words when you are down to even making mention of the declaration of independence to texans um that shows we are uh, way down the road way down the road in uh, unsafe territories and i want to make it very clear unless you want to live like they live in that beautiful island of haiti you don't want a civil war. No. You don't want that. Yeah. You I, don't want a society to break down. Yeah, civil war, uh, bad. But we're going to go with bad on that one. I mean, you, you look at Haiti, they don't even have good weapons in Haiti. And it's, just, it's a complete catastrophe. I know. God only knows what. So, I, yeah. I mean, but I don't think, you know, obviously, I don't think Ken Paxton's calling for something like that. But it does. No, no, no. He's yeah. not. Yeah. And he's not. And he, and he mentioned just standing up and fighting. Look, we all stand up, uh, stand up every day to, to argue on behalf of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. But it, like, it, it does feel like this is something we've talked about a few times, Glenn. It does feel like we have the courts in the way of catastrophe and then that's it. And I, and I, I, I constantly go back to that Sheriffs. and feel like, gosh, just, just a couple of people really standing in the way now of, of, of losing our republic. I mean, you've talked about it hanging by a thread many, many times. It feels like we're kind of there. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we are... <clears throat> We're the Constitution's hanging by a thread and we're in a scissors factory. <laughs> and the guy rushing to save it is Edward Scissor Hands. I mean, we're not really in a stable place. I don't know if you missed that. 
Uh, that is the perfect analysis as to where we are as a country, uh, hanging by a thread with Edward Scissorhands coming to save us. Uh, can't say it better than that. Glenn Beck, a new special is coming yeah. up tonight, Thank 9 you. p.m. Eastern. It's uh, debate is the TikTok bill at Trojan Horse for government censorship. Make sure to stay tuned for that. And, you know, look, subscribe, policetv.com slash stew. The promo code is stew. You'll save 20 bucks. We really uh, do appreciate it when you support the Blaze. It's a supporting journalism I think we're all going to need, as we, especially as we go into the election season. Glenn, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, when you absolutely have to sell a home, maybe because you're running from mobs, uh, if you want to do that, maybe your city's on fire and you're looking to go somewhere else. Uh, you got to have a good real estate agent. And realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go to find that person. Our previous guest, uh, Mr. Glenn Beck, started this company uh, many years ago to try to figure out a better way. We all look at this process, and I think we're all sort of perplexed by it. Unless you happen to be an agent yourself, you're looking at the real estate agent, and you're like, gosh, I don't. I don't know what any of this means. I don't know where the best place to go. That house looks nice. I, can I afford it? Is it a good school district? Who knows? Well, realestateagentsitrust.com does. Uh, the name kind of says it all. Go there. Go to realestateagentsitrust.com. These are people that you can trust the best in their industry. In, they're in your area no matter where you are. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. Realestateagentsitrust.com. All right, I got about two minutes and I got three stories to get to, so I got to go fast. Um, Joe Biden has privately told Bibi Netanyahu that he is not trying to push him out. This is bravery like we've never seen before. I mean, Joe Biden is basically Oscar Schindler at this point, isn't he? And what I mean by that is Oscar Schindler also couldn't publicly support Jews. Uh, so that's the only thing I think that makes them similar. But he's not outwardly. Uh, calling for their annihilation. I mean, other members of his party are, and he's not saying anything about that. But just so you know, uh, Joe Biden is, he wants you to know if you happen to be a Jewish Democrat voter, he's really on your side. He just can't say it. He's saying it privately. And then, of course, the Democrats are saying publicly that they want him out. And then the rest of them are saying from the river to the sea, we don't want any Jews. So it's a really it's, it's going well. Uh, the Biden administration, though, has some major accomplishments. You know, it's a lot of times you think, uh, what, what is what has gone on? They've been able to accomplish nothing. That's not true. It's not true at all. They've now tied tied the record for the most LGBTQ judges in federal courts. And that's incredible. I mean, the most important part of finding a judge is what genitals do they like hooking up with? That's the most important thing about a federal judge. And now they've tied that record. And, and to, to Biden's credit, uh, he's done it in three years where it took Obama eight years to do that. So technically, Biden is even gayer than Obama. And that's something we can all um, cheer on. And Don Lemon is still in the news, unfortunately. He wanted a, ro he wanted a ride on Elon Musk's rocket to host the first podcast in space. Don Lemon in space. I, this is something I think we can all get on board with. First of all, I gotta say, I'm starting to like the Don Lemon thing because I just like the balls that he has to just go in there and be like, hey, I'm the nation's 9,000th most popular news anchor. I need a trillion dollars to do a podcast. I love the gall of it. I mean, it just like, he's like a, a 218 hitter with no power and no speed asking for $80 million a year. I, I just, I don't know, there's something I like about that. But the other thing I like about it is we can absolutely all unite that we all really, I think, want Don Lemon to be shot into space. When you stroll through the grocery store's meat aisle, uh, do you know where that meat is coming from? Some of it looks kind of funky. Well, most of it is imported from God knows where. And it, a lot of times it'll say product of the USA, but that sticker means nothing. It just means it was packaged here, so not raised here, not produced here. Uh, there is a solution to this, Backyard Butchers. This is a Christian, Texas-based company, and it's dedicated to delivering the best deals on high-quality American raised beef. 
no matter what you like to eat, I mean, you don't want to eat mystery meat. You don't want uh, you don't want all that nonsense in there. You want good old fashioned beef if you like beef from the heartland of America. And right now, if you go to backyardbutchers.com slash stew and use the code stew, you will save an extra 20 percent off your entire order. When you subscribe, you get an additional 10 percent off. I mean, grilling season's right around the corner in, in Texas. It's kind of here already. If you're in Minnesota, you have like that one week period where you can grill out. You should take advantage of that with Backyard Butchers. Uh, support American farmers with Backyard Butchers. Head to BackyardButchers.com slash stew in order to box up your American raised beef today. BackyardButchers.com slash stew. Joined now by Dan Andros. He's managing editor at CBN News and host of CBN's Quick Start podcast, which you should definitely subscribe to. You can get it wherever you get your podcasts. Dan, thanks for coming back. All right. Thanks for having me, Stu. Uh, you've been covering for CBN this week and uh, as well for uh, the Quick Start podcast, this hearing in the Supreme Court. And it really is fundamental to the First Amendment. Uh, we covered it a decent amount yesterday going through some of the comments. But you watched the entire thing. Did you get the sense that that the Supreme Court is looking to say, yeah, sure, the government can just you know go behind the scenes and influence these companies any way they want? It's a really weird case, too, because it's kind of uncharted territory with social media companies, right? We, we, it's not like we have some precedent or something we can look back on. It's like, how how do we actually manage this? And uh, I didn't get the sense that the court is going to actually uh, favor this case at all. Really, they were you saw, you saw people like Kavanaugh sort of criticizing the case. Alito jumped in and and had a couple thoughts that I had as well, actually, when I was uh, looking through the case, because what they did was they looked at some of these communications. Essentially, the heart of the case is, did the Biden administration go too far in coercing social media giants uh, to suppress certain speech that they didn't like? And I think, first of all, for starters, too, that's a very difficult case to prove. How do you prove to when it goes from just them calling up and, you know, I don't know what what happens probably a million times a day with journalists, like when there's a where's a piece they don't like. These sorts of interactions happen. When does it cross the line into coercion? And so that's what they're trying to have to prove. Uh, and I think it's first of all, that's just difficult to do. But second of all, in most of these cases, particularly when X was Twitter and it was not controlled by Elon Musk, all of these social media giants were willing participants. Like they're very happy to listen to the Biden administration, you know, they're all mostly left run by left wing individuals. Uh, so it's hard case to prove. And then a lot of it is just you got they're not really being coerced because they don't have to be coerced. <laughs> That's a very, very good point, though. I would argue I don't know that there is a line between just p pleasant contact and coercion when it's coming from the government. I mean, if you're an employee at Twitter and you get a message from someone at Chuck Schumer's office, and it's the nicest thing in the world. Hey, we just don't really think this particular tweet is uh, help, you know, serving the people. We well, you know you guys got a tough job over there, but if you wouldn't mind re removing that one, we'd really appreciate it. Even that is coercion, right? Like a any yeah. time, if you're just a random employee at Twitter, you get this call from Chuck Schumer's office, what are you going to do? Yeah. And as we're as we were talking about this on our coverage, a, a viewer pointed out to me, like, it sounds like maybe uh, Dan would be in favor of the White House holding some sort of a press briefing where they can explain their <laughs> side of things. Whoa. I was like, you know, hey, that's a good point, uh, because that's where the government can do this. Right. Do they have to call them up directly? And I think that's where people uh, were frustrated and kind of alarmed and shocked because. What happened was you had all these things happening and posts getting censored on Facebook. And if you dared to say anything that didn't rah rah the vaccine, you'd get you'd get censored. And then we find out later after the fact that, oh, by the way, the Biden administration was just zinging emails, yelling at these people. And that's sort of the shocking thing in these emails when you see some of these interactions it's there. And Alito pointed this out. And, and I'm going to let me read you Alito's quote. The, the tone that they send to them is not one of what I was describing as would be maybe potentially acceptable of just, hey, we didn't like that, or can you change that? This is what the we actually think it is. Do with it what you will. Uh, he said, I cannot imagine federal officials talking like that to the print media. If you did that to them, what do you think the reaction would be? 
He said it is treating Facebook and these other platforms like they're subordinates. Mm. Would you do that to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, et cetera, et cetera? And it's like they're swearing at them. I mean, like, who does that unless you feel like you're in a power position over them? And it certainly feels like coercion at that point. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, look, I, I agree they sh they're not subordinates, right? It's actually the reverse. The government is a subordinate to the people. And, you know, people at private companies... Uh, are have voting rights to throw them out, right? Like this is a, the, the, the subordination is actually reversed. Um, but I mean, I will say knowing a lot of uh, PR people, press uh, types uh, over the years, some of which who have served at high levels in government, I mean, they aren't always nice to the New York Times. They aren't, aren't always nice uh, to conservative media. I mean, think of the, the outreach we got from the Barack Obama administration back in the day uh, when you were here at The Blaze and working with Glenn Beck. It wasn't always so positive. They had no problems calling us. I don't think any of that is good. You're right. The press and their caller uh, was right. The press briefing public announcements of these things is a fine way to handle it. 99% of these cases can be just stated. Look, we think the vaccine's wonderful. We think Facebook should take down all those posts. At least we would know about it uh, rather right. than it going behind in these sort of backroom deals that they deny for years and years and then eventually have to admit when the evidence comes out. Yeah, and K Katanji Brown-Jackson, you may have seen this too, went kind of viral for saying, uh, and I want to read it so I don't mess it up, but she said, my biggest concern is that your view, you know, the guy bringing the case, is the first, uh, has the First Amendment hamstringing the government in significant ways. And uh, that raised a lot of <laughs> eyebrows for obvious reasons. I mean, it's, you know, and look, this is the way progressives view the government. They, they view the government's job as to uh, control the message and then curate some experience for people that only has their view of the truth. And uh, progressives are okay with that, right? And conservatives traditionally have not been. We'd like to just hear all the views. I mean, you saw it in the Don Lemon interview with Elon Musk. Don Lemon could not understand why Elon Musk would leave certain, while maybe grotesque speech, why he'd leave it up there. Because this is why Twitter turned into such a mess in the first place before Elon took it over was that they were trying to only have nice views out there. Well, I got news for you. There are a lot of different views out there among the 350 or so million people in America. And you, you just have to let these views, for the most part, be heard. And then you just let the best ones win. Like, that's just how we've done it in America. You can't try to curate this safe experience and all the language that progressives bring in now with, well, I, this speech harms me. Get over it. Grow a thick skin here and let's let uh, let's let the discussion be had. And if you want more on this, by the way, we did a monologue yesterday on, on both the Elon Musk, uh, Don Lemon interview and Katanji Brown Jackson specifically, because, you know, to, spoiler alert here, the First Amendment was created specifically to hamstring the government. It's actually the whole yeah. purpose of, of its creation. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of a big issue. Hey, I want to uh, switch topics real quick to uh, Haiti. Uh, this is out of control. I mean, we have a failed state right off our shores. This is a state that we have, you know, people are flying in for nice vacations in the Dominican Republic right now. And yet right uh, on the same landmass, you've got Haiti, which is now in a basically a civil war with no real government left. It seems to be the state pol or the, you know, the, the, the nation's police versus a bunch of gangs, no leadership. I, I mean, you did a documentary about Haiti a while ago, and it was bad then. It's disintegrated since then. Yeah, I've never been somewhere. Look, and when I was with you at The Blaze, I went to Iraq while ISIS was still controlling Mosul. So I've been in a couple of different shady, shady situations, right, Un in unstable situations. I've never felt more insecure than I did when I was in Haiti traveling on the countryside it feels like the Wild West. And this was like a few years ago now, five or six years ago at this point. It feels like the Wild West. There's no police around. I interviewed actually one of these gang members who uh, at that time, uh, there's, I was interviewing an American missionary, missionary there who stayed when everyone else had to evacuate out when uh, there was some big unrest there in Haiti. And so 
I actually interviewed one of these uh, gang leaders and it was very intimidating. And um, that was when they didn't have guns in front of me or anything like that. But um, I can only imagine now what it feels like there where they're actually killing people, they're rioting, they're controlling the cities, they're controlling towns, they're, um, you know, it's getting to the point now where there's on the flip side, vigilante justice. So the people that are sick of it have banded together and formed groups and they are actually rounding up some of these prisoners, these thousands of prisoners who escaped and they're executing them in the streets. I mean, it's really out of control and it is a really desperate situation. And for anyone who thinks, oh, well, it stinks for them. It just doesn't bother, it doesn't concern me. Well, a lot of the migrants that make it to the Southern border are from Haiti already just because it's a uh, impoverished nation, one of the poorest in the whole globe. So you already had a high number of them coming now. With this accelerating, you can expect a flood of migrants to come to the southern border, and we all see how that situation is going. Yeah, it really is horrible. I mean, there's the reports on the ground are basically like, People just have to stay inside most of the time because the violence is so bad. I mean, then they mm -hmm. sneak out in between violent episodes to go to the grocery store for for what? The airport's closed. Uh, the roads in are closed. Uh, the, the ports are closed. There's no way really to import anything into this country anymore. I mean, they're just living off of what they have. There are worries that they may just completely run out of food and no yeah. aid can make it in either because there's not even a government to assist it. It is a no, and then, ter terrible yeah, and situation. And then all the uh, gang leaders and these corrupt individuals control the ports. As if you remember, during after the earthquakes and the hurricanes, all these countries were bringing heavy equipment on barges, but then some of them wouldn't want to pay the bribes to go on to get onto the dock. And so they actually had to turn away all this equipment that people were sending to help because they didn't want to pay bribes to the people who controlled the docks. I mean, that's the sort of thing that's going on there now. And there's Americans still trapped there, Stu, and Representative Corey Mills in Florida is trying to help rescue some, and he's done that. We interviewed Mitch Album, who's the author. You know, he has an orphanage that he runs there in Haiti. He had to be a, a – he escaped in the dead of night. Um, and uh, our own Billy Hallowell talked to him about that harrowing experience. And so the Biden administration has been criticized for not uh, acting swiftly enough to try to help these Americans get out. Corey Swift is like our like it's like a like Jack Ryan right now for the country. He's just going around the world, just freeing people as a congressman. I, I, it's I, it's an incredible dude. Look, I'll take this. If this is I'd take that congressman rather than like, you know, the uh, the Bernie Sanders types who are just out here pushing the communism and whatever else like if, this is all it is all i'm like how's this guy doing this i thought he's like in congress and all nope he's on planes over there trying to get people out <laughs> so yeah it's great eventually we'll make a great movie of course hollywood will never make it uh dan andros no. managing editor of cbn news uh, be sure to check him out on cbn's quick start podcast head over and subscribe today dan thanks so much for coming on all right thanks Stu. okay so here's what happened. A sad story from one of the greatest places on earth, Bucky's. Bucky's is a, um, it's a store. Uh, I would say it's like the Disneyland of convenience stores. It's like as big as Disneyland, except it's just, it's a convenience store. It's incredible. It's the cleanest place you've ever been in. It's, I love it. They're all, there's a few of them around Texas. Um, but what happened in this particular story was someone was not welcome. Your kind was not welcome over at Bucky's. An employee came in um, and uh, he's now banned for life uh, after he brought his service duck into the store. Now, <laughs> the exchange is detailed at incredible length. Where's this sort of reporting on like Hunter Biden? But uh, an employee comes over to tell the guy pets aren't allowed in the store. He says, I can give you three forms of identification right now if you'd like. I, that's not really how you answer that question. He, uh, she, she, he says it's a service animal. Another employee comes up to him and says, hey, you're more than welcome to stay here. The animal cannot, no pets in here. Um, your animal, even if it's considered a service animal, you have to be able to contain it and it can fly out because he didn't have a leash on it or anything. It was in a stroller. <laughs> anyway, the cops were called and the guy's thrown out and now he can never come back. So no Bucky's for him or the duck. Very, very sad. By the way, you can get your uh, uh, Joe Biden shirt right now. Joe Biden, elderly man with a poor memory. It's available now. StuDoesMerch.com. The code is Stu10. We'll see you tomorrow at Bucky's.